Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we talk about the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna, and me, Frederick. This week, we are sitting with Flavio Bergamaschi from IBM Research, where he acts as a senior research scientist. This week, we're going to be primarily talking about FHEs. So welcome to the show, Flavio. Thank you. Now, we've talked a little bit about FHEs in the past, but I think this is going to be a very interesting episode because it's going to give us a chance to kind of catch up with what's been happening in the FHE research space. I don't think we've ever really talked about, you know, at a fundamental level, sort of what it is or um, what the current state of technology is or even its development over time. I think um, we talked a little bit about this in the preamble of like there are, there seems to be a lot of preconception about what fully homomorphic encryption is, is capable of doing or not capable of doing. And um, it'll be interesting to dig into all these things and see what status quo is totally all right so i uh, i like to start all these uh, conversations about fully homomorphic encryption fhe for short <laughs> with, with a question that uh, that i ask the audience typically when i'm presenting so uh, imagine what you could do if you could compute on encrypted data without ever decrypting it right so if the data was always encrypted what are the things that you don't do today that you would be able to do uh, with this technology? What are the kinds of answers that you get sometimes? <laughs> oh, there are several, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I guess until people actually um, realize what it brings to the table in terms of uh, privacy and confidentiality and everything, uh, you see that uh, people will be um, more inclined to share information because that information is never in the clear. Mm -hmm. And also that people can compute on that without leaking um, the information. So you might have data breaches and everything else, but the data is being always encrypted is less of a risk. And this seems super relevant right now, as we see the need for more kind of shared data in order to map the goings on in the world. And yet, now there's a lot of concern that like, how, how could you actually keep any of that private? It's necessary that we compute all of these things en masse. And yet, yeah, we don't necessarily have, it feels like we don't yet have the tools to do this in a way that will be beneficial to the individual or fair to the individual. Maybe that's a that, better way of saying true. it. <laughs> um, the main thing is that uh, these days people carry less about privacy and uh, confidentiality, individual privacy and confidentiality that they, they, they used to do before. There is a lot of a social sharing of pretty much everything. And uh, with this technology, it may be, um, may be possible to do this, to achieve a lot without having to give away so much uh, about your life, about mm. what you do, about where you go, or not. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, we've had some discussions on this in the show in the past, and I think it's an interesting sort of people have gotten accustomed to a certain lifestyle and to some degree fixing it, like increasing privacy means going back and, and like taking things away from someone. Uh, but going back almost never works. So you need to find new solutions to, to let people do what they want to do, but still improve so things like actually still preserving their mm -hmm. privacy. Before we dig super deep into things, I still want to know, you're at IBM Research, why is IBM interested in this? And what does a, a research scientist at IBM do? Right, so IBM actually uh, invented this technology about 10, almost 11 years ago. Uh, and when it was invented, it kind of uh, solved a question that people had had for more than a decade on how you could uh, perform complex computation on encrypted data. But at that time, it was very slow, <laughs> terribly slow. <laughs> so the, 
the one of the quotes at that time was um, people said, oh, this is fantastic mathematics and everything else, but not in my lifetime. Oh, not in my uh, lifetime was the, oh no. <laughs> well, now, right, with all the advances in algorithmic and, uh, and collaboration across the world, uh, it's at a speed that's practical for certain use cases, right? Uh, and this is uh, one of the points that uh, we focus now because becoming practical uh, in terms of performance, algorithmics and use and so on, it, you can start putting that into to the market. It is still um, not as early days as it was in 2009, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But um, it, is, it is that inflection point where things are fast enough for applications that require privacy and confidentiality. But going back to that question from Frederick, like IBM research, maybe it's good for us to understand a little bit more, like what is the goal of IBM research? Is it to explore certain sort of theoretical threads to see if there's applications or was there already some IBM project that prompted this? Well, when it started, it was more uh, theoretical and uh, has been evolved with um, funding grants for us to advance the technology. And uh, now we are actually looking at co-designing what becomes an asset with clients and with the users. Uh, and this is an important thing because, like I asked, imagine what you could do if you could compute on encrypted data without decrypting it. So we need to talk to clients to understand better the use cases. We have a plethora of use cases, but those were related to what we know. Mm. Right? So if I offered you a technology that allowed you to do things that you were not able to do before, but only you know what you were not able to do before. <laughs> right? so, and then it's this co-design. So IBM Research um, typically will do research in very advanced areas. We'll also try to bring these emerging technologies, uh, try to emerge them and validate whether those theoretical advances and so on are actually useful or not for everyday usage so it's a very uh, a very long game <laughs> uh, it is uh, it is a long game but it's the kind of things that when you get to that inflection point it becomes a very short game and you have to play it quickly mm. <laughs> yeah. because it becomes when it gets to the inflection point it gets to the inflection point for everybody right everybody yeah. out there that's doing homomorphic encryption is also in this inflection point of um, technology so we've had, we had Luca DeFeo uh, on, I guess, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Um, and he's also somebody who's uh, in IBM research working, in his case, on isogenies. I'm curious a little bit, like, would you ever be working with Luca? Do you have different groups that focus on these different uh, topics? How does that work? <laughs> We have different groups that focus on different topics, uh, but we all collaborate. We all talk to each other. So it's not like uh, you go back to your shed at the back of the garden, <laughs> you do everything <laughs> and come back out of it with a, a new invention. It doesn't work like that anymore, right? So collaboration is the key. Got it. And uh, we actually collaborate a lot with them. Um, with the other researchers in IBM, but other researchers uh, in other institutions. Some of our competitors are also our collaborators on the oh, cool. algorithmic point. So it's, uh, it's not like some one man does it hidden and comes back with something. No, it doesn't work that way. It's, uh, That's interesting. it's a lot more uh, collaboration these days. That was actually a question that I had was about whether or not there was sort of a competitiveness between maybe IBM research and I don't know, like Intel research or these other groups that will be looking into things. I wonder, does it, does it have at all like echoes of Bell Labs or like Xerox Park kind of vibe, these research, these in like corporate research departments? Well, I didn't 
I wasn't at work when Bell Labs was doing what they were doing right at the beginning, <laughs> right? So, but uh, I read a lot about them. So it is, it is somewhat different than it was before, but not that much, right? Because within the corporations, we collaborate internally in IBM. Uh, we also publish the work that we do and other uh, people like Intel, Microsoft, and uh, the academics and the universities and so on, they also publish their work. And uh, we share we share information. So we publish a given hour and people use and they might enhance it. And uh, then we see those enhancements. Similarly, if they come up with some new ideas, we collaborate. So the, the community now has become a lot more um, amicable to collaboration let's put it this way, mm. but also fierce competitors. So it's a kind of, a, <laughs> it's a tricky scenario, right? Mm. Certain things we, we, we collaborate a lot and certain things we compete a lot. So we are collaborating on the standards for home morph encryption. So it's a consortium, which is, a, it, it's a consortium which is ad hoc. Everybody that is doing home morph encryption said, oh, perhaps we should we standardize these, otherwise everybody's going to different directions. And if, uh, if a product come out of it, how people can be sure that it's, that follows certain standards. So we have been busy trying to, for the last few years, trying to, to get there. Um, it is, it is a hard uh, thing to, to standardize, uh, in terms of, because each one had their own implementation, so on, but now we are converging to certain schemes and uh, we are looking for w which body which standard body to join or to propose the standards for sounds a little bit like the same maybe slightly later in stage than the zero knowledge proof community which is also trying to work towards creating standards for things like circuits and how to express these different constraint systems of a zero knowledge proof if everyone comes up with their own method, then none of the tools are interoperable. You can't, you know, create a proof with one library and verify it with another or anything like that. And if it was standardized, then you'd have a lot more uh, cross collaboration. That's very true. Uh, and uh, we, we are in that phase, right? So we, we recognize that there needs to be a standard. Uh, and uh, as as a group, we are trying to come up with that and identify at what level that um, interoperability should occur. Mm. Yeah. So focusing in a little bit more on FHEs, what's your research in this, and you know how did you become interested in it? Well, I've uh, I've started kind of a working with it back in two thousand and fourteen or, or so when. Uh, our colleagues in uh, Yorktown were doing the, uh, most of the research around FHE, and we were looking at uh, options to accelerate that. And since then, uh, I've been devoting time to it. And more recently, when I say more recently, it's in 2017, half mid 2017 or so on, then we start entering what we call a new a new phase in the development uh, because back in 2009 when people uh, when a colleague of ours invented FHE then we start what we call the plausibility phase let's check whether this is plausible or not right and from 2012-ish uh, onwards we started the improvement phase which is okay it's plausible <laughs> How can we make it go a little faster, right? And uh, we have been working on this improvement phase. But back in 2018, around the industry, everybody started the usability phase, which is when you start making the technology more robust, useful for usable by normal users. You don't need to be a mathematician or a cryptographer to write. You still need the help of those, mm. right? <laughs> We've been focused on the standards part very much and the serviceability. So it, there is a lot of uh, software engineering work going right now. And uh, so I've been involved since 
2014 in different phases of this. And uh, now I lead the team. Well, we have a team and we, we all work together in making this a more usable technology. What were you doing before IBM? Oh, before IBM, I had several past lives, <laughs> let's put it this way. As have we all. <laughs> uh, I uh, I am a physicist, and uh, before that, before IBM, I worked a lot on um, high performance computing and um, uh, radar technologies. Oh, cool. So um, I want to get to that point of answering the question: What could one do? <laughs> but um, I think to get there, we have to first answer what FHEs actually are. Uh, as as we said earlier, we've talked about it a little bit on the show before, but we've never really defined it, I think, in any sort of fundamental level. Um, so fully homomorphic encryption. You know, I understand the word fully and I understand the word encryption. <laughs> What's the thing in between and how does it link together? Now, I guess starting at, um, you know, the, your explanation from before, computing on encrypted data, I think that that's a, mm -hmm. a good summary. But if we dig one level deeper, you know, what, what does FHE mean? Right. So in 2009, when Craig Gentry, an IBM researcher, invented FHE, until then, you could, when you say compute on encrypted data, it means can you perform the basic mathematical operations, which are basically multiplications and sums on encrypted data without decrypting it. Until then, you could do one or the other within this, what we call the same scheme, which basically limited uh, to some extent what you can actually do, right? Uh, by being able to do both sums and multiplications within the same scheme allows you to perform complex computation because you can use those as your building blocks. So if you think of a machine learning, what's the machine learning language that you can do? You can do some and multiplications, and now you build everything else on top of that basic capability. Right? With that, you can think of a matrix computation, you can take in what people call polynomial evaluation, and with polynomial evaluation, you can approximate functionality, mathematical functionality which basically means that you can build very complex operations. Is the ability to do both addition and multiplication in this encrypted kind of black box, is that the fully part? Is that why you say fully homomorphic? Because you can do both at the same time? Or is the fully, does that mean something else? The fully means that plus something else. Okay, <laughs> okay. so fully is you can <laughs> add and multiply plus plus the ability to have arbitrary uh, depth of computation meaning that you can keep doing additions multiplications uh, almost forever oh, that's cool. the fully part cool the partial homomorphic encryption is either one or the other got it right and there is another one <laughs> which is the somewhat homomorphic <laughs> encryption <laughs> <laughs> that is related to being able to do just a certain number of uh, multiplications and additions before you can't decrypt anymore, or before, before you can't make sense of it. Got it. So it doesn't have the depth that you just described, I guess. That's right. Yes. Well, but there is enough depth. So we, we most of the applications that we have built to date did not require the infinite depth. And the infinite depth or so is not because it's infinite, it's because when you, you perform up to a certain depth and then you perform a, uh, an operation that's called bootstrap, which basically means that it everything to the top and you can keep doing it and you recrypt to the top again and you keep doing it. So this is the fully, fully homomorphic encryption part. <laughs> okay, that's the fully. Yes. So I think that... I, if I understand it correctly, that essentially means that you can do it on any sort of arbitrary computation. So I, I can essentially express 
any arbitrary program to compute over this data, right? If I have it fully, whereas if it, if I'm limited in depth, I'm limited in what I what my program can do. Is that right? You are limited on the on the algorithm of your program. Yeah. Yes. Like the number of uh, operational steps. But we can combine that with protocols. Uh, if you have two parties computing, the server part computing in the cloud, there, the client, you could potentially perform the computation up to a certain level, send it back to you, you decrypt, recrypt, and send it back to be computed again. So it all it all has to do with um, one of the characteristics of that uh, computation like that uh, we kind of skipped a bit. <laughs> which has to do with whenever you uh, encrypt a message, something, right? You are basically hiding that in a lot of uh, clutter, in a lot of noise. That's what we call it. So, and uh, your message is hidden in this fuzzy noise. Whenever you perform an addition, that noise adds up. But whenever you perform a multiplication, that noise multiplies, right? So, and if this noise grows too big, you can't decrypt the result anymore. You can't actually see anything on the result. Mm -hmm. So the techniques that are involved are some techniques that are involved to reduce the noise as you go along, but there is only so much you can reduce, and then you have to stop the computation that you're doing. So there are certain uh, circuits as, as one mentioned before, that allows you to perform the computation that you need to do. Uh, for instance, logistic regression for machine learning, we can do that without requiring this uh, recryption or this bootstrapping. So it can be quite complex computation that one can do before you need to um, bootstrap or to recrypt. Mm. And uh, some of the more neural network related so, uh, scenarios you need to perform a bootstrapping. So this um, leads me to the the middle word homomorphic, <laughs> right? It just means that it morphs to something that is the same. It's property preserving, but it is exactly. Well, what is it preserving? Homomorphic. When 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 operations have uh, homomorphic characteristics, let's just forget about encryption for a moment. Right. So if you have a value, two values, value A and value B, and you have a function f, so you can compute f of A as one thing, and you can compute f of B as a separate thing, and then you can operate those two by multiplying or by adding them together. Now, if this have homomorphic properties, it means that uh, the same f of a plus f of b equates to the f of a plus b and that's that's where the it comes from so if i can perform that operation that way it means that what i'm doing separately represents the same thing as if it was done together so if that function is an encryption function, I can say that the encryption of the value A operated with the encryption of value B is equals the encryption of A plus B. Right. Mm. And, and that is how you perform this computation on encrypted data that represents the same result at the end. Does this mean, does this sort of like open up an opportunity for this idea of like parallel paral parallelization this idea of doing things at the same time because the sizes would be is it wait actually maybe this is completely off but are the, the are the sizes of the outcomes the same is that when you say a plus b or is it more like the outcome no the the outcome the actual the value. actual outcome so if I have an encryption of one plus encryption of two, uh, that is the same as the encryption of one plus two. Okay. Right. This is this is one part. Got it. Now regarding parallelization, this is another property that uh, certain implementations have, 
which allows you to pack data in a ciphertext. So what is a ciphertext? Ciphertext is take up a value and you encrypt that value. The result is a ciphertext, is your message, is your values hidden in this noise. So this is your ciphertext. Because the way uh, the ciphertext is constructed, you could consider that as a ciphertext can have several elements inside, encoded inside, mm. right? And if you have several elements encoded inside the ciphertext, whenever you do an operation between two ciphertexts, you do them element-wise. So I can put the value 1, the value 10, the value 15, all in the same ciphertext. And in another ciphertext, I have other values in the corresponding elements. Whenever I multiply or whenever I add to ciphertext, those happen element-wise. So the first element of the first ciphertext with the first element of the second ciphertext. And this does allow for parallelization as long as you can turn your problem into a vector solution, which mathematically, or we, we tend to say, so is logically, it has a kind of property that I'm not sure how many people remember that in school, uh, which is called single instruction, multiple data. You have multiple data being operated in a single instruction, so that's when you, then you get that. I don't know if they teach that in schools anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know if they teach it in schools, but SIMD at least is like in engineering and like, oh, I want to optimize something. Let me see if there's some SIMD instructions somewhere that I can exploit to make everything faster. That's exactly the same. And we, we got very good at exploiting that, at taking a problem and kind of a, a converting the input data in a way that it can be resolved in a SIMD way. The other interesting aspect of a full homomorphic encryption is if everything is encrypted, if all the intermediate values are encrypted and everything, and conditional variables in your code are encrypted, how do you branch? Mm. Because you can't test. You can't test whether a variable is true mm. or if the variable is false to make a decision. So you end up having to execute all the paths in your code. Right. Uh, which basically means that uh, you start designing this the code with um, less of those branches <laughs> because those cost a yeah. lot right and try to make them more like a circuit yeah that makes sense and usually especially if you're not very careful you can very easily have an explosion of paths in a program where it's yes i mean it, yes it's sort of increases exponentially <laughs> oh no yeah oh yeah we we have been through through that because as part of the grants that we have for working on home of encryption we have one from the u.s government to to construct a tool chain for um secure computation home of encryption being one of them so the idea is at the higher level the programmer can specify the security constraints of the application and code in a normal way with some annotations and um, then this two chain will do the compiler version the, com the intermediate language and everything to convert it down to homomorphic encryption code so as part of this program we are giving uh, what they call challenges challenges are use cases right a given use case that you have to solve the best way you can with the technology that you have, with the algorithm that you have, with the theory that you have. And some of the solutions are really exponential, <laughs> right? <laughs> Today, right? But we know how to move this forward and take advantage of some of the techniques that we discussed, like the SIMD operations or packing of more information. But we don't, we, we can't do that at the programmer level. We expect the programmer will write any program and then the compiler has, is the one that has to, to fix it up. Today, it's a cryptographer helping the application write right. to understand. So you, we have to understand what's the business case? What is your yeah. algorithm? Okay, so what if we manipulate the data in this form that will make it easier for the home of encryption to achieve performance? Before we move on, and maybe this gets too complicated to explain, I don't know, but I'm curious, 
what was the innovation? Like, what was the step that you know was taken in two thousand nine that actually managed to achieve bringing together addition and multiplication under one roof here? Right. <laughs> so it wasn't like it isn't someone that woke that woke up and they just said, "Oh, this I'm going to solve it." <laughs> right. So, so this is uh, building on a lot of uh, research and uh, that had happened before that was happening at the time and uh, the, the the final step was to understand how to work with lattices that would exhibit the property for both multiplications and additions within the same with the same scheme right so that that was the tricky part uh, but there was a lot of researchers around the world were collaborating and uh, Craig, when uh, he wrote his PhD thesis, actually was based on all the research that other people did, but had not got that far enough, right? So he was able to combine different things and uh, come up with, um, with a solution that would work. And uh, since then, there have been a lot of improvements and uh, different solutions that accomplish accomplish the same. Can we can we actually talk about what lattice how do you say this is it like lattice based cryptography is that the way you word that? Yeah, we're going to need we're going to need a full <laughs> podcast just to go through that. That's <laughs> actually good to hear. Maybe we should do we that. We should absolutely do that. We have touched on <laughs> lattice based crypto before, especially there are some, you know, quantum secure algorithms that depend on some of this, right? Uh, does that mean that Yes. You know, the FHE is quantum secure? It, it is. Uh, that means that FHE, I, I like to say that it's quantum resistant. Yeah. It's the appropriate right. way to because put it. Because to the best of our knowledge <laughs> today, there is no quantum algorithm that can break um, homomorphic encryption with any less complexity than a normal computer. So it is quantum safe. Yeah or quantum resistant, I would say. So I think we've covered the three words, right? Fully homomorphic encryption. I, is there anything else we have to say about the last one, encryption? I mean, I, I, the, the fact that it was lattice-based is news to me. That was interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It is lattice-based. And, uh, uh, and also it's a public-private scheme. So you encrypt with one key uh, that you also use for certain of the computations, but you can only decrypt if you have the secret key. I, I want to throw out a use case, something that I imagine that I would use if I had unlimited access to fully homomorphic encryption. And then you can tell me how close we are to that in reality. Okay. And the use case is uh, very relevant right now, uh, where there's basically doesn't exist a video conferencing software that has end-to-end -end encryption. And the reason is that the server, so you know, every person is sending their video feed. And if you did it in a P2P way, then you would be sending, you would be receiving maybe 10 video feeds and you'd be sending one, but receiving 10 video feeds, something like 30 megabits per second is too much for anyone's connection. So what actually is done is you send it to a central server that central server multiplexes together all these video streams and sends you one. Uh, so re regardless of how many people are in a room, uh, you know, you as a participant only send and receive one stream. And it can, like the server can multiplex all these different streams into one because they're not encrypted. And so you can't have end-to-end -end encryption in video conferencing because you know it, it can't perform this basic action. So People talk about various ways of solving this, but one very neat way of solving it would be if I can send the server an encrypted stream, and then the server can take all these 10 different encrypted streams and compute a multiplexed version of that and send it out, and then the participants can decrypt it. That's, uh, that's an interesting use case. If it wasn't for the size of the ciphertext required for more ah. <laughs> right? Uh, because the size of the ciphertext is very large. Um, yeah. And uh, having, having different keys of encryption and computation, it is, it is possible, but it is something that we, that's on the, the research side right now. 
right? So we, we have ideas on how that can be done. Like I encrypt with my key, you encrypt with your, with your key, and uh, Anne encrypts with her key, and, and then we multiplex everything together, and then we send it back for decryption. The question is, which key you would use for decrypting? So there are ways, uh, some of these is very experimental at the moment, that allows you to do that. But on the homomorphic encryption side, it would be uh, the ciphertext. If we are able to encode the video in a way that we can represent on the ciphertext, it would be very large size, mm. which would make it a plus. The computation would take some time to perform. That multiplexing operation wouldn't be... Uh, it, it wouldn't be real time. Wouldn't be as no, simple, let's put it this way. Homomorphic encryption is good for applications that you can accept some delay. It's not today not efficient for real-time computation yeah. because the encryption decryption takes takes a long time. We have been working on acceleration and we have been looking at how to use hardware acceleration and even the goal for hardware acceleration is that we can bring the overhead of homomorphic computation for certain benchmark use cases down to 10 times, mm -hmm. meaning it takes 10 times longer to perform computation homomorphically than it takes to perform it without encryption. What are those um, benchmark applications and, and sort of what is it really good at, would you say? So the, the benchmark applications that we have been given uh, are related to machine learning scenarios, mm. either regression-based machine learning or convolutional neural network uh, machine learning scenarios, whether we can do that with uh, at most 10 times the overhead. So this would be something like training a model on encrypted data? Training a model on encrypted data or doing the inference, doing the actual um, prediction. So doing the prediction on encrypted data using um, regression-based algorithms with a given number of variables, 16 in our case, we got it down to 50 times. So it's one order of magnitude. It's not a thousand. So, so I got that 50 times the, the overhead. Now doing the training, it's longer even because the, doing the training, even without encryption, takes longer yeah, than, than, than just the inference. Uh, but the ability to train a model is important. The other experiment, a successful experiment that we did, and that was part of the work that we did with one of the, our clients, our banking clients, uh, was to retrain an existing model with new data uh, that's encrypted. Because this, this is something that a, most of the people that use regression-based algorithms or machine learning-based algorithms do is over time, as your data changes, your model loses its stability. It's not as stable as it was before. So if you're getting new data or new trends that are for the prediction that you want, can you take that new data in an encrypted form and retrain your model? Right, so this is one thing that uh, we, we show um, could be done. Uh, we publish a paper on that and we implemented it uh, as a proof of concept. So our next steps will be to generalize what we did and uh, that being offered as one of these higher level functions that you can do over homomorphic encryption. So you don't need to do just multiplications and additions, you can actually <laughs> call a function that will do something more tangible. Is the tricky bits like, what, what causes a lot of the extra time? Is it, because with the video example, you mentioned like the size of the data. So is it the size of the data or the complexity of the, the computation or maybe both? Like which one makes the situation worse? If I had two small numbers and multiply them together, would it be way slower to have two large numbers and multiply them together? Or would it be way slower to like multiply them twice? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's, it's more related to the volume. So let's, abs let, let's abstract from the, from the video scenario yeah. for a moment. 
Encryption. So when I encrypt something, I basically, as I said, I'm hiding my message, my secrets, in a lot of noise. The way this is represented is um, by constructing a polynomial, right? The ciphertext is represented by two polynomials, not only one. And the order of this polynomial to achieve the security that is needed is of the order 60,000 to more. So we can do it, depending on the security, you can be a little less, like 32,000 or so. But that's the order of the polynomial. Now, the coefficient of that polynomial can have 400, 600 or more bits, <laughs> right? So there is no computer that can do 600 bits or 1,000 bits computation today. So you need to break that into a smaller representation, which basically takes those 600 bits coefficient, break them in the equivalent of a 54 or 64 bits coefficients. But then you end up with a lot more of those, right? And the way you compute these operations at the lower level is actually uh, by performing fast Fourier transforms. So FFTs, you can, back again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you can see that if, even if I have one number, let's say the number five, right, which is, or the number one, that's only two bits. When I need to represent those in this ciphertext, I end up with this massive ciphertext to put the value one. If I, if I exploit that uh, packing that I mentioned before, I can put multiple values in there so the operations can be performed uh, homomorphically. And, and that's where the computation goes, mm -hmm. right? So that's where the additional overhead happens. And the, the trick here in making this computation not so expensive is actually looking at the use case and uh, see how much of that I can do, I can exploit that SIMD characteristic that my ciphertext has. Right? The more I can do that, the better, because the cost of me doing a multiplication of a one element or 16,000 elements is the same. Hmm. Right? So in the prediction scenario that we had, the batch size that we were using for predictions was 16,000. So I could do 16,000 predictions in Ten, about 10 seconds, just under 10 seconds for a security level of 256 bits. To do one prediction takes the same 10 seconds <laughs> if I don't exploit that capability. But that also means that to do, if, if I had another thread where I can run a separate prediction, I can do another batch of 16,000 within the same 10 seconds. So it goes 16,000, 32,000, 64,000 within the same 10 seconds. So quite often people try to, to talk about the performance of homomorphic encryption in terms of the amortized costs. I don't like that too much because <laughs> unless you are doing a batch, it's, uh, you're not going to amortize anything, right? So. Mm. I have sort of a ba very basic follow-up question here on is there a difference in terms of the timing of mu multiplication and addition? Yes. Like, so if you had this partial homomorphic encryption or one of the other ones, uh, I forget what they were. Somewhat. Partial and somewhat. then... Somewhat. Somewhat, yes. Um, if you were doing just addition, would that be faster? If I'm doing, even using a fully homomorphic encryption implementation, if I'm doing only additions, it's uh, faster than if I'm doing uh, multiplications. Multiplications are costier. Okay. But multiplications are used in pretty much everything. So yeah. when, you're, when you are doing the inference part or the prediction part, you do one matrix multiplication plus one polynomial evaluation. So you can't... But certain types of aggregation, this is an important actual question that you ask, because certain type of operations, like if I'm doing... Let's say I have a spreadsheet with values, column volumes. And what I'm doing is I'm doing only 
doing aggregation, which is basically summing those values and computing standard deviation or, or computing averages and so on. That can be done quite efficiently because now the only thing you are doing is all the columns are going to be added and at the end you're going to compute an average or you're going to compute a standard deviation uh, which involves a squaring but depending on what you want to hide when i say hide is what you want to protect you can use some hybrid schemes like i don't need to do the division homomorphically if i'm not worried about how many entries I have in the database, so how, or maybe how many rows I had in my, in my uh, spreadsheet. Yeah. So there is, there's, some, there's some interesting scenarios that people can do. One of the first times that I dug into FHE constructions was in, uh, it was in a study club that I did. Um, it was actually about Nigel Smart's speeds protocol, which combined MPCs and FHEs. Mm -hmm. And I wondered about that combination with other techniques. You know, are, it, are FHEs, like, they can be used in tandem with MPCs, as we've seen, but can they also be used in tandem or somehow together with, uh, like, zero-knowledge proofs? All these technologies can be complementary. They can complement each other. So FHE is not the answer for everything. Right, so it, it is it is a it is a nice scheme and so on. But whenever you deal with security, you have to analyze what exactly you want to protect, what is at risk, and therefore use the correct combination of the technologies to to mitigate any risk or so. So let's say. One, one of the scenarios that's quite common these days is called co-marketing. When you have different companies that may have data sets that overlap and they want to perform some, some type of uh, analysis on this data set. But they want obviously to protect the privacy of the entries in there or the, the, the names of people or so on. So you could use home of encryption to compute what is called the set intersect. The set intersect is revealing only what is common to everybody in terms of whatever you use for that common. Let's say a simple example that happened before this virus scenario, but people traveling to a given city will be going, using a given airline, they will be reserving hotels, they're gonna be going to restaurants and so on. And quite often this is all disjoint. Right, so if someone wants to do a co-marketing, they're gonna say uh, the airline is gonna talk to some of the restaurants in a given city, to some of the hotels and so on, to understand how many of their passengers stay at a given hotel and eat at a given restaurant and so on. Because if you do that, and if you have an understanding of their spending patterns, you can come up with a promotion whereby you say, oh, if you buy the ticket from me, you get discount on this hotel or a voucher for this restaurant or, or so on. So this is the co-marketing scenario. To do that, you need to find out whether my passengers stayed at your hotel. So there is the privacy part, which is the people's names. But I'm not interested on the individual. The interest for the co-marketing is on the aggregation, is on the demographics that you bring that up. So you can use homomorphic encryption to compute this set intersection, or you could use uh, other types of uh, encryption that may be faster to compute the set intersection, but then you use homomorphic encryption to compute the aggregations mm. that you want to perform, right? So, and, and this is a technique that, uh, just as an example of com com using, let's say, AES, for encrypting the keys that you're going to search on and using homomorphic encryption to encrypt the values of what you're going to be computing on. So that there will be most of the cases that we expect for the future will be related to where you can combine homomorphic encryption for certain things with other types of uh, protection. Right. So the, the one scenario, the one scenario that I like, which is um, 
not that difficult to do homomorphically, actually. It's the, the kind of things that we used to do before we were told to lock down our home is whenever you leave home for work, the first thing you would do is pick up your phone and uh, ask a service somewhere, what's the traffic like? Where's the nearest coffee shop? And so on. And when you do that, you are basically giving away a lot of your privacy yeah. to whatever service is performing that operation because they're collecting all that information and they can combine with your neighbors or so they start to understand your patterns of life which you may not want people to know <laughs> mm -hmm. right so if we're able to perform that same query to a service in the morning homomorphically uh, the service would give you the answer not knowing which answer it gave you and only you can decrypt that mm. the answer so it would change the business models of a lot of people out there but I'm, <laughs> my job is on the privacy yeah. side <laughs> you couldn't make that query for free anymore because the company can't sell the data anymore mm. yes totally well, that that has to do with one of the the facts that whenever you ask a question you are revealing intent and when you review intent, you are giving away a lot of, uh, of data. Yes. Of information. Yeah. So going back to that first question that you posed to the audience, this idea of like what applications could be possible with such a, a tool, what are the most popular applications or what applications are you currently excited about? I know you've just mentioned a couple. We had this sort of marketing one, um, but maybe you can share a few more. So let's look at the industries first, right? So industries that are regulated, and those would be the finance industry, healthcare industry, and so, and the government, because of confidentiality and uh, oblivious queerness that my people might want to perform, are the biggest candidates for using this technology to protect the privacy and the confidentiality of, of the information. Protecting the privacy confidentiality um, means several things. A lot of the industries and companies that are very serious about it will have uh, that data in a very segregated environment. So people can't steal the data or can't exfiltrate data. But the data exfiltration is also one of the biggest issues that we have because at the end of the day, someone in a company that has access to confidential private data may, for whatever reason, take the data out of the company. So any uh, application or any environment where the data is private and with more regulations like GDPR and others, now you need, there is the need for more control of that privacy, are potential candidates for that. So the scenario uh, that I, one of the scenarios that we focus us a lot was even within a given company, different organizations in, a, in the same institutions. Let's say there are institutions that provide you with retail banking, with investment, with insurance, with health insurance, and quite often they own the hospitals that you get treated on. Mm. So it's a lot of data coming from different parts of this organization that may be coming together for any operational requirement that they might have. Someone is actually seeing that data in the clear. And when that happens, is the, the, that group is the weak link for data misuse or exfiltration. So being able to apply home morph encryption at that layer while we still allowing data analysts or analysts to perform the analysis that they want to do but only see the result of the analysis and not the individual entries are the type of applications that are um, candidates and that involves uh, not only finance but also involves healthcare yeah so the scenarios where data analytics needs to be performed are the ones that uh, we see as a uh, as a good candidate these days. And yeah. one of the proof of concepts that we run was on analyzing transaction data to predict whether someone uh, will be needing a loan 
in the next three months. If you can predict that well, the companies can do upsell loans. That's mm -hmm. one scenario. Uh, but the other one that's kind of a hidden in there is that when you do that, you are actually performing an, an, a, some sort of analysis on the financial health of the individual, which then could be used to provide uh, advice on spending or all sorts of uh, other combinations that people do, like you can aggregate your credit cards to pay it in a given schedule or so on. It's so funny because even in that example that you just gave, there's always two sides to it, right? There's the potentially positive societal impact of like finding people who maybe would need a loan, suggesting that they might be in financial trouble, meaning maybe we can help or we can upsell, <laughs> which is usually the opposite of helping. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Interesting. And uh, But there's also the scenarios where... Um, for, for instance, on the healthcare scenario, let's say that you want to check yourself for some inherited condition, whichever one that be, right? Color of the eyes or color of the hair or some illness. So you're going to go through uh, some genetic screening, right? And then you're going to send your, your genetic material to be tested by, by a lab. Yeah. But that's all in the open. With homomorphic encryption, we could do that in a homomorphic way. So only you, when you get back the result, can decrypt the answer or your doctor, depending mm. on the trust level that people have. Mm. And the other one is when you, when you have multiple entities that would never share their data. If now they can share their data in a, a secure way, where only the aggregation or the results of that aggregation is revealed to the parties. Those are some of the um, the new applications that are going to be uh, that are going to be appearing. Although that one sounds an awful lot like NPCs, like kind of exactly like what an NPC is designed to do, right? This aggregation of multiple sources with only the final, with only the sort of combined result as displayed. Would you need to combine FHEs with MPCs to make that possible, what you just described? No, I guess it depends. depends on the application. MPC is basically, the, the, the boot part computation in this sense is each party will compute a little bit of the, the answer and then they have to combine everything to find the final answer. Mm. And as you said, everybody will see what they are allowed to see. For homomorphic encryption, you could use with MPC. There are certain techniques to do that. As I said, they complement each other. Uh, the scenario where I mentioned that uh, a server might be computing part of the computation, send it back to you, you decrypt, recrypt, is, is somewhat kind of a, a multi-part computation between two, two entities mm. uh, where there isn't much trust on one side. But the scenarios where you might want to... Um, outsource the data and the computation to a not so trusted environment, being it a multi-tenant environment or being a cloud environment, are, are the ones that uh, people will, uh, will be uh, using home of encryption more, which is I have the cloud there, I trust, but I don't trust the cloud that much. <laughs> Right, because and this is actually one of the threat models. One of the threat models is known as honest but curious. It's going to honestly perform that computation, but it's going to be looking inside. Mm -hmm. And for scenarios where you have a threat model which is a lot more complex, where uh, the entity perform the computation might be dishonest, then there are other protocols in combination of homomorphic encryption that could be used to accomplish that. So you might have a collection of uh, uh, participants. Some of them are honest, some are dishonest, or some are malicious. And uh, we can combine other protocols for that. It's more like categories of applications as opposed to a single application. And I think uh, to the point of the original question, it's also not like there's the perfect answer like it is very much like what can you imagine doing with this 
There probably are things that no one has yet imagined. That's very true. Some of our clients came up with some, oh, can we do this? And the first question that, uh, well, so, some, some of those are very <laughs> pragmatic approaches that, yeah, that's a given use case. Perfect. It makes sense. And some are, what do you want to do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But there might be a business case. So this, this, is, the tr this is the tricky part of, of this interaction is, is not only to talk to the developers, right? Is, is exposing this technology in an understandable way to the line of business. Because now the line of business might say, oh, I can combine these two pieces of data. I never thought I could do that. If I can do this, oh, I can discover something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. To wrap up, uh, I want to bring it back a little bit to what you mentioned, you're entering this phase of usability. So what are you actually building and doing to make this usable to me, the average developer? Right. So what we are doing is we have um, our library is open source. It's on GitHub on uh, home link slash HELib. And uh, Throughout last year, we made four beta releases and early this year we released version one. And soon we're gonna release version, another refresh of version one, which is 101, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh, but has, has uh, enhancements and uh, fixes and everything. This is the GitHub part, so it's there. But we have also been working on how to make everything more consumable to developers. And there are several ways of doing that. One is by creating self-contained examples with little tutorials that people can, can follow at different levels. Someone might just want to know what I can do, right? So I can do a query, great. Uh, and some want to know, oh, what happens under the covers when, when they do this query. So we are, we are working through creating those um, scenarios and examples. And uh, the first one will be available in the IBM Research uh, Try Our Tech uh, website in a few weeks for people to, to follow there. And then a follow to the, um, to the GitHub and in parallel with that, as I mentioned before, there is a grant of the U.S. government to make this as a toolkit, right? So, and that will uh, become available every time something new that we do becomes usable. Then we will make it available to, for people to use. Is that kind of grant work open source as well, or are there conditions? No, the our library is all open source. It's Apache Apache license. Cool. We'll uh, get those links in the show notes so people can find them. Yeah. As a final uh, sort of note, I, I wonder if someone really wants to dig into this, wants to you know, either get involved with research or start working on this, what would your advice be to them? We are right now making, um, actually bringing what is the open source into a more collaborative um, environment and uh, we'll have this announced uh, soon on where people that want to to help some 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 people out there have been helping and uh, we have been taking some of the collaboration that people have been given uh, but I guess the one thing that's missing from from everybody is a kind of a, a, a tutorial that brings people in right so you don't need to be a hardcore cryptographer if if there is a tutorial that explains and the other thing is if you are willing to learn about lattice crypto and the modern arithmetic and uh, some of these things so if you're not afraid of learning then um that is that is an easy way to to collaborate and learn well, I hope if there's uh, one way to describe our audience, not afraid of learning uh, would be on top. So uh, we'll uh, see if, if anyone gets interested enough to dig yeah, in. And thanks for helping us explore deeper this fully homomorphic encryption. Thank you very much for being on the show. Well, thank you. Great. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.